Thanks. We are joined this evening by Tyler Crone, who is running for state representative position number one. Tyler, go ahead and give us your two minute introduction. Absolutely, fantastic. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here with you. And it is an honor and a privilege to be in discussion and to be running this campaign in partnership with all of you who have been organizing our district for so very long. I come into this race as a first time candidate, as a parent, as an expert and leader in global health, and as someone who has been a champion for human rights my entire career, my entire life. And I think that this period of time as we see the Roe v. Wade overturn coming down and we see the incredible uptick, at least in my family's friend circle of COVID-19. Um, we have a lot of complex challenges around the country, around the world and here at home. And I'm looking forward to working by bringing people together for solutions, by bringing my public health expertise, by bringing my perspective as a parent who has raised three kids in Queen Anne and been a public school parent since 2008. And really in this moment where Washington State and the 36 has the necessity and the mandate to lead to bring my perspective as a human rights champion and advocate. My husband is an immigrant and a leader in the immigrant rights work across this country and across the state. Our daughter is transgender. State legislatures across this country have been criminalizing families like ours and kids like hers. And it is a key reason why I get off the sidelines. And as we've seen just in this past week, we need to have champions who have demonstrated impact in advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights and reproductive justice, because the influx of individuals seeking care will continue to rise. Thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go ahead and turn to our prepared questions. These are two minute responses and they're posted in the chat. And Shep, will you go ahead and take this first one? Thank you. And you are on mute. Oh, sorry. What tax, thank you. What tax reforms do you think are realistic in the next legislative session? And what would your strategy be for implementing them? What do you feel is the ideal tax structure for Washington State in the long term? Thank you. I think that this is the a critical piece that I have continued to be in conversation with Noel Frame around since this is her sweet spot of expertise and leadership. You know, I think we're all feeling the upside down regressive uh, nature of our tax structure in Washington state. And it runs across the board for what the crisis we're facing in schools as they lurch from funding cliff to funding cliff. The, burden that small businesses are facing with a disproportionate burden of, of B&O taxes. Um, and where folks, we can't keep steady investments, for example, in public health, perhaps rise to the challenge of mental health, the mental health crisis our teens are facing or our unsheltered neighbors on the street are facing. And it even is coming up as a, a question of revenue around investing in childcare as uh, the public good that it is. So what my strategy is at the moment is to understand and learn from those who have been working on this for a very long time to see where I need to pick up the baton and lean in with them. I think that we have a lot of business interests in our state who are not paying their fair share. That concerns me that we're passing that on to small businesses. I think that the long-term ideal tax structure for Washington State is one that I've got to come to in conversation, but it looks like, at least from what I'm hearing from, from friends, neighbors across the economic spectrum, that folks would really welcome an income tax and get rid of the regressive tax structure where you and I all pay as many taxes as, for example, a Bill Gates. So I'm gonna pause there as I'm running out of time and look to be in continued dialogue with all of you around those immediate short-term fixes. Thank you. Thank you. Clayton, will you go ahead and take our second prepared question? Sure. Given fa falling enrollment over the past two years, 
Our school districts are facing a new funding crisis on top of the bare minimum funding levels in place before the pandemic. What will you do to ensure that our schools are fully funded? Thank you so much. This is a critical heart question for me. As I said, my three children have been in Seattle Public Schools since 2008, and I've been a parent almost continuously at our local co-elementary since that point in time too. And I understand that our teachers are exhausted, our administrators are exhausted, and our support staff are exhausted. Many of the families who can exit our public schools have exited our public schools, which I think impacts the overall excellence and equity within them when we don't have everybody in the system building to make it a fantastic public school experience. I am, I think that the piece, there's a two prong piece of one, just being an unabashed champion and having at the core of my campaign, my campaign platform, needing to fully fund our schools and to re-examine what the definition of education means. Teachers I have been in conversation with who have taught, for example, in Florida, where there is no income tax as well, they have a different standard of how schools are funded and it creates stability and it creates excellence in their public schools. If Florida can do it, Washington can too. I think that the question about falling enrollment requires that we're addressing COVID-19, that we're buoying up our excellent teachers and support staff and our administrators, um, and that we're bringing people back in and having that conversation right now. There's currently, to my ear, in conversation with Vivian, who is our board director for District 4, for the schools that my students are in, my kids are in, there is not that conversation yet about the enrollment crisis we face. I am deeply concerned about it. So thank you all for posing this. Thank you. Jeremy, will you take our next question, please? Uh, one moment, just need to unmute. Uh, okay, how have you worked to reduce climate change and specifically how will you take ambitious steps to address the largest drivers of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions? Thank you all for this question. The piece around climate change and climate justice and upholding our environment relates back most strongly to the work I've done and the expertise I have in public health and the movement building I've been a part of for human rights and social justice around the world. So the framework that I bring to the climate crisis we face and the climate change the requirement that we have to rise up is bringing that public health and equity lens of thinking about how our climate actions are woven in across from a public health framework and of bringing that background of being a movement builder globally for human rights, social justice and climate justice. I'd like to say that the piece that the ambitious steps to address the largest drivers of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions again comes back to the formula that I've shared prior of learning from those who have been in that area for a very long time of where are the sticking spots, how can I bring as a new candidate as someone who has not been part of that system an independent view, shake things up and bring more energy and strength to it of the expertise I have around bringing coalitions and diverse partners together and of tackling complex challenges that require us to take hard stances and to perhaps be a dragon slayer I think that um, we have an extraordinary opportunity and need to rise up. We've had incredible leadership in this state. I'm learning from, for example, State Senator Reuven Carlisle, how he sees his legacy going forward and thinking about how do we bring this frame in throughout our energy and at and efforts around transportation, how are we bringing this energy and frame throughout how we're addressing housing, how we're addressing how we're growing and managing um, that in our community. So let me pause there, thank you. Thank you. Pat, will you take our last prepared question, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Hopefully the dog cooperates, but. Um, so, in addition to the climate crisis, King County has also been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, and our entire state is, fa is facing a housing crisis. 
Do you agree that we need to add additional housing and what will you do to ensure that our cities in our region are building at the housing that we need? Wow, this is a this is a meaty question to dig into in two questions in two in two minutes. I think that housing is a human right, and it is unacceptable that Seattle, as extraordinary wealthy with the brain trust, the incredible businesses, and all the rest that we have here, have not risen to solve this. I am deeply alarmed about the fact that we do not have spaces for all the people who need it. When we do these sweeps, we do not have a place for folks to go. And so one, we need additional housing across all, all levels, right? We need an immediate answer for folks that are living on the street in tents. We need to build out that missing middle with smart planning and smart density that brings in gray and green infrastructure, again, bringing our thinking together around how we're we responding to this climate emergency and how are we responding to a, both a housing shortage and an affordability um, challenge. And the statewide approach of building up the housing and the density across the board. I, I think that that is a piece that we need to tackle um, with smart planning. I've been really excited to talk to folks in Magnolia that are showing examples of building density over the Albertsons um, that will rise up, that will be a green living building and will have housing available across different price points to also incentivize the kind of density that we need and putting additional housing. Because currently when I see small houses, sold and lots sold in the neighborhood I live in, in Queen Anne, that is getting one more very large house and we are not incentivizing affordable housing or it's potentially getting uh, a handful of very expensive um, townhomes. Thank you. Thank you. We will now open up to our executive board for one minute questions. Does anyone have any questions for Tyler? Jeremy. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, um, when we, in the income tax question, you, or sorry, the, the progressive taxation question, you, um, you mentioned that you support an income tax, which, um, I'm glad to hear that is part of the 36, um, that is part of our platform actually, but, um, but, um, we've supported an income tax for a while and, um, Obviously, there is a lot of resistance to it. How would you, um, how would you work to build the coalitions to bring people on board so that we can get that type of tax passed? Thank you so much for the question. I want to put one point in here because when I was in conversation with Noelle Frame, she has a vision, and I want to understand how you hold both that we need to leapfrog above an income tax and. Uh, focus on a wealth tax and lead as first in the nation as we have among minimum wage. So let me pause it and put that out there that that's a conversation I'm on having in an ongoing way with Noel Frame. I think that what we have seen, if nothing else, with the impacts of the pandemic is how much our revenue has created a crisis, right? Our lack of revenue has created a crisis. We have I think there is a ripe moment with the escalating inequality, which I think is one of the biggest challenges Washington State and faces, seconds. that would bring new partners to the table and unusual partners to the table to gather around. And I think we see the traction for that in the increased um, excitement, excitement about unionization. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, Tyler. Um, you have convinced me in the times that I've uh, heard you speaking and met you that you are a terrific organizer, an activist, a movement builder, um, a beautiful speaker, communicator. But how do you how do you think that that experience will translate? to writing and passing legislation in the legislature, which is a pretty nuts and bolts job. So I'd just like to you to speak about your experience um, going into the legislature. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. So I think one 
part of this role about building change and advancing coalitions and, and moving that into legal frameworks, right? is about having the stakeholders who are going to make us accountable, who are going to make sure it's resourced, who are going to make sure we move from what is a nice law on the book into something that is tangible in people's lives. And so my background and experience, for example, in HIV and AIDS has been to develop model laws and in legislation that has been brought into force. And for example, the Southern African development community, that it was, I did a great a multi year stream of work working with ministers of health and gender ministers around how do we strengthen attention to gender based violence and the work of engaging men and boys for gender equality. So I have had that developing model laws and working um, with the decision making bodies in different countries to put those in force, but also to get the budgets behind to make those real. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Um, my question, like many others, um, uh, bears on the question of persuasion mm -hmm. of uh, people who are not convinced that, that uh, we should change the stru tax structure. So if you, if you were invited mm -hmm. to give a speech to the Associated General Contractors tomorrow at nine o'clock, what would you say to them to persuade them that it is, it is in their interest to change this tax structure such that it is not the most regressive in the United States of America? I would invite them to think about the home front, to think about the quality of education that is available to their kids and their neighbors, to think about the childcare crisis that they might face. I would also incentivize them to say, wow, you want Seattle to be safe, thriving, vital, healthy neighborhoods. We have a homelessness crisis, a mental health crisis that we are not rising to. We are not solving. We are putting Band-Aid after Band-Aid after Band-Aid on. And so I would invite them, if nothing else would convince them that they want the development, they want the expensive homes, they want the tourists, we need more public safety and we need revenue to be able to address that because our continued focus on the symptoms of the problem without addressing the upstream issues is, is a challenge. And so I would go across the board from their economic vested interest <clears throat> to their home front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and this David. will be our last question. Thank you, Laura. David, you have our last question. Oh, oh. Um, so, uh, you know, I was going to ask uh, another income, another tax question, because as someone who's self-employed, um, I get tired of hearing this myth that Washington State does not have a income tax, uh, because I pay an income tax quarterly. Uh, um, but since that question's been asked uh, several times, versions of it, I'd like to ask a question about infrastructure. Um, our city, our state. Um, we seem to have a lot of infrastructure that's at some point in the near future going to stop working for us. Um, we already pay uh, the second highest gas tax in the country, mm -hmm. right, uh, which is supposed to be funding our roads and our bridges. Um, how would you propose uh, that we get the funding and the will to fix our bridges and our roads. You know, David, this is a, such a great question and I'm so thankful for Janice Traven who has given me a 101 on the Magnolia replacement. Um, it is outrageous to me that again, we live in Seattle with so much wealth and we have so many potholes. I. Um, live, I grew up on a peninsula as well with one of the scariest, it was, it was basically called one of the worst bridges in the country um, before it was replaced. So I, I get this infrastructure issue. I am committed to figuring out where the roadblocks are and being noisy as hell. I think if you think of the example of a mosquito, they bzz, 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 keep after it. 
it is outrageous to me that one of the concerns that parents and friends I have is we won't drive over the Ballard Bridge and leave our kiddos at home in Queen Anne because if God forbid an earthquake happened, we would be separated and couldn't get back. Thank you so much. Thank Please you all with your one minute closing. I am excited to be in this race. I am excited to be keeping a spotlight on public health as a key frame and as a key pillar as we continue to navigate, recover from, learn from, build resilience from, and reimagine after COVID-19. I am extraordinary, extraordinarily honored and delighted to be a part of this with my friends, my neighbors, the, the, the moms and dads and stakeholders who have been part of the community with me for the nearly 20 years that we have called Queen Anne home. And I'm really determined and driven to be the human rights advocate to rise up on the critical issues we are facing across this country and that we need strength and leadership around here at home. So thank you all for the opportunity to be in conversation and I look forward to next steps and partnering for success and leadership with the 36. Thank you. Thank you so much.